the name of our Savior Jesus, the friend of sinners, the friend of you and me. Think about your relationship with your friends. How often do you talk with them? A couple times a month? A couple times a week? A couple times a day? What do you talk with them about? What's going on in their lives? What's going on in yours? Is there anything you're afraid to talk about with them? I suppose it depends on how close of a friend it is, right? Is there anything you're afraid to hear from them? Are you willing to listen to whatever they have to say to you? No matter how much it hurts. Because they're your friend. And they care about you. We just saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Well, how close of a friend? How often do you talk with him? What do you talk about? Is there anything you're afraid to talk about him? About with him? Are, are, are you willing to listen to everything he has to say to you? Because he cares about you? Even if it hurts? Genesis chapter 18, we see a great example of a man talking with his friend, the Lord, and Abraham. And we ask God to give us a faith like Abraham and give us a prayer life like Abraham to powerfully, boldly, and persistently go to our friend in prayer. Last week, if you recall, earlier in Genesis chapter 18, we heard that Abraham was visited by three men. But if you look really closely, you see that these aren't regular men. One of them, as we saw at the very beginning of our text today, Abraham's talking to the Lord. It is the pre-incarnate Son of God. It is Jesus before Bethlehem, before Caesar Augustus, before Mary and Joseph, before the census, talking in a tent with Abraham and two of his angels with him. And recall, they came to, to tell Abraham that next year at this time, God was going to fulfill the promise he'd made 24 years earlier to Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son, that that, that line of the Savior would continue through him, and ultimately through his offspring, the, the greatest promise God makes of all to Abraham, because there are about five times in Scripture before Genesis 18 where God and Abraham had a conversation with each other, but, but the greatest conversation they had was certainly in Genesis 12, where he said, through you and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And on this day, on that afternoon, when God came to him in Genesis 18, he's, just, he's keeping that promise, right? And next year you'll hold Isaac in your arms. What's a friend? One quote says, A friend is someone who knows everything about you and still likes you anyway. What do you think about that? A friend knows everything there is to know about you, the good and the bad, and still wants to be with you and be your friend anyway. I'd say that sums it up, right? That's a true, a true friend. But those are hard to find. In the world of Facebook that we live in, people have thousands of Facebook friends, right? But go to them if you really need something. How many of them would you confess everything you've ever done to? How many of them would disappear into the woodwork if the time came for you to really be helped in a desperate way? A true friend would be there. And Abraham, in spite of his many, many shortcomings and failures, would not be afraid to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend I have in Jesus. As we said earlier in Isaiah, God calls Abraham his friend. In the book of James, in the New Testament, Abraham believed God and he was called the friend of God. Remember, this is the same guy who not once but twice pawned his wife off as his sister, basically threw her to the wolves in order to save his own skin. And yet he knew and he believed God's promise that the Lord is faithful and merciful, 
to those who fear him. And like Romans tells us, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That same Savior who calls Abraham his friend calls you his friends. Doesn't Jesus say that? You're my friends if you do what I command. Here's a friend who who knows everything there is to know about us, certainly all of our many, many, many shortcomings, and still calls us his friend anyway. The things we have done in the light and the things we've done in secret. How many of your friends, if they knew everything you've ever thought about them and everything you've ever said about them when they weren't around, how many of those relationships would still be the same? Or how many friends would you lose if the truth came out? And yet here's Jesus, who knows it all. You're my friends. And he he backs it up. He says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. He puts his money where his mouth is. He says, you want me to really prove it to you? Watch this. As he hangs on a cross and dies. You're my friends. And he tells us everything we need to know. He says, everything I've learned from the Father I've made known to you. In his word, he doesn't tell us everything we want to know. There's certainly times where we go to him and say, Lord, I wish I knew a little bit more about this, or I wish I had a few more answers about that, but he tells us everything we need to know and more. Reveals himself as that, that holy, just God who takes his word seriously and demands righteousness from his people and, and is, is not happy when we decide to go on our path instead of his path. It tears him up. And I pray that the law does the same for us when we confess at the beginning of a worship service, I'm by nature sinful. And I've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed that, 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 that just crushes us. And like a servant to his master, it puts us on our faces with tears in our eyes and our souls saying, Lord, have mercy on me. But then he reveals himself first and foremost as a gracious God. He says, take heart, your sins are forgiven. And I will remember your wickedness no more. Yeah, what, a, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, absolutely. And it's that same friend who says in, in Luke, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. Notice he's calling on us to action there, right? Those are active verbs. Ask, seek, knock. He wants to talk with us. He wants to have a conversation with us. Us to him in prayer. Him answering us in his word. Nowadays, it's tough to get a hold of people, isn't it? In the, in the days of caller ID, someone calls you, you see who it is, you can decline. I'll talk with them later. Not now. You call about your credit card, about your phone bill, press 1, press 4, press 8, enter your number, and five minutes later you finally get to someone, and okay, your wait time will be 22 minutes. I just want to talk to someone. It's not like that with the Lord. You call on him in prayer, he doesn't say, oh, it's Wolfram again. Good grief, he just called yesterday. Decline, I'll get to him later. It's not call on him in prayer and say, well, take a number, you know, I'm I'm a busy God. I got billions of other people talking to me. Get in line. I'll get to you when I get to you. 22 minutes. You don't drop the call by Lake Dubay. No. Here's it all, the prayers of the righteous. From the prayer of the four-year-old, Jesus, please keep mommy and daddy safe, amen. To the prayer of the 84-year-old with a cup of coffee, contemplating life and their purpose in it, watching the birds in their bird feeder. The hour long, he hears it all and answers it. A few verses back in Genesis 18, the three men, so Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, and the two angels are talking with each other, and they say this. Jesus says, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Friends tell each other everything, don't they? Good friends. And he says to these angels, should should we tell Abraham what's going to happen? Remember, there was... Two things going on in Genesis 18. Not only were they there to give the birth announcement of Isaac, but also here's what's going to happen, as we heard today, to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of their immorality, because of their wickedness, I'm going to rain down fire from heaven and destroy the city. Why tell them that? Can't you just kind of let the chips fall where they may, and when Abraham sees it, 
Okay, now he can come to God in prayer. Why did he want to come to him beforehand and let him know what was about to happen? Well, it was an exercise in Abraham's faith, wasn't it? To give him an opportunity to get on his knees and wrestle with God in prayer. And Abraham took advantage of it. Because remember, he had some vested interest in Sodom and Gomorrah. His nephew was there. And his family. Lot. Right? Lot, who scripture kind of portrays as maybe a little self-centered and selfish. Remember when they had, came time for the division of the land? There's just too many of us in one place. What are we going to do? Abraham says, well, pick where you want to go, and then I'll go where you don't want to go. And Lot picks the choice land, right? He picks the, the fertile pasture, and then Abraham's forced to go to the rocky places. And maybe the sinful nature in Abraham, when all this played out, and God announces to him what's going to go on with Sodom and Gomorrah, could have said, well, serves him right. What they call karma, right? You, you had it coming to you for the way you treated me. But no. And back in Genesis 14, we, we learn that Abraham went to war for these people in Sodom and saved thousands of lives. And now here's how they turned out, these immoral perverts. Abraham could have said, they got what's coming. Good. Let the fire rain down, Lord. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He, he, he prays, Lord, spare them. For the sake of 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, even 10, spare them. What a selfless prayer for people who certainly didn't deserve it. Does that, does that mimic your prayer life? What's your prayer life like this past week? Think about your prayers. How, how quickly we get on our knees for I and me, maybe less frequently for he and she. If, if it's us and our skin or someone close to us, we're often quick to go to the Lord in prayer and boldly and powerfully pray to him. But when it comes to others, how many times have you said, I'll pray for you? Oh yeah, what was I supposed to pray for again? I'm ashamed to admit that, how many times I've told someone and promised them I'd pray for them. And it just goes in here one day out the other. And I thank God at those times that Jesus says your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask him. What does your prayer life look like? Inward or outward? You can't gossip with Jesus, right? Friends talk about everything with each other to a gossipy fault. Jesus knows it all. So go to him and talk about everything, about anybody. There's another quote I read. We give to others in their need no greater love or care than when we give them to the Lord, surrounding them with prayer. So don't just pray for your family, pray for all these families. Not just this church, but all the churches. Not, not just all our churches, but every church. Even where, even where the truth has been compromised, that God continues to keep his law and gospel there. That God's word continues to be present. Which means his spirit is there and he's working. So, Abraham, we see he says, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. And two times he says, may the Lord not be angry. And two times he says, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord. What would you call that attitude we see in Abraham? Humility, right? I don't know how, how often you really think about it, but in the, the service on page 15, the common service, we do the confession, we do the absolution, and then we sing glory to God, glory be to God on high, on earth, peace, goodwill to men. And right after that, before the prayer of the day, I say, the Lord be with you. And then you respond, and also with you. You know why we do that? Why that was put into the liturgy so long ago? Think about what's happening. We're about to approach the throne room of God in prayer. Us. We better have the Lord with us, right? The Lord be with you. And pastor, also with you because you're about to ask God for a petition on behalf of you and all of us. That attitude of humility. Though dust and ashes in your sight, we may, we must draw near. And that's good and right for us to remember. Like Abraham, notice here the, the difference between Lord and Lord. I don't know if you caught it when I was reading it, but when God talks, it's the Lord in all capital letters. Jehovah, the God of free and faithful grace. When Abraham talks, it's the Lord with a small O-R-D. Lord, Master, I'm your servant, and I beg you, please listen. 
if it's your will. And, and, and that's really a, a big part of it too. If it's your will, that will be done. Maybe, maybe his will is not to take away the pain, but to replace it with patience. Maybe his will is healing for the soul rather than the body. Maybe his will is the loved one goes to be with him instead of stays here with us. In Abraham's persistent prayer, 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10, and by the end, even there were not 10 righteous, and Lot's wife ends up dying, and Lot and his daughters have an incestuous relationship with each other after this is over, not, soon af- not too far after. And some may wonder, why did God even listen to, 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 to this at all? Why didn't he just destroy Lot and his daughters with the rest of them? And it says later in chapter 19 this, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew those cities where Lot had lived. He remembered Abraham's prayer and he answered it. So of course a lot of people say, well, ask and it'll be given, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened. Yeah, I do that all the time and I ask for things and God doesn't answer it. It's amazing how your faith grows, how the content of your prayer changes. That you don't ask as much for things, but that God give you a heart to appreciate the things you do have, as many or as little as they might be. That you don't ask all the time for him to fix relationships here, but you thank him that he's fixed this relationship here. That the pastor doesn't pray, Lord, give us a hundred new members so it looks good on a statistical report and we can have all this money in the coffers, but you thank him for the, the 20, 30, 40, 50 members you do have and that the word is kept pure and that you can faithfully administer God's sacraments to his people. Lord, thank you for that blessing. As the faith grows, the prayer changes. Again, always according to God's will. So Abraham, what a model. Remember this story, Genesis 18, this week as you approach your your king, your master in prayer. Boldly approach him and know that your prayers asked in Jesus' name are both powerful and I pray that they are persistent. Amen.